Gwynapnir is often referred to as a god of liminality, a king, a fairy, a ruler of the Welsh otherworld, and a leader of the wild hunt. In today's video, we will be exploring this enigmatic god in this bite-sized video, which will give you an introduction to him and hopefully lead you down the rabbit hole of learning more about him. So without further ado, my name is Mara Starling, I'm a Welsh folk witch, and this is part of a series known as Welsh Deity. 101 and today we're talking Gwyn Ap Nir. So who is Gwyn Ap Nir? I think the first thing we should talk about is Gwyn Ap Nir's name. What exactly does Gwyn Ap Nir mean? So Gwyn is a very interesting word in the Welsh language. It's a name but it's also a word. It means white. If you were to look up the word Gwyn in the Welsh dictionary today it would tell you that Gwyn means white, the colour white. However it's a bit more complicated than that because Gwyn can mean a lot more than just the colour white. So if I was speaking in my first language and I said you know Marpapir nan Gwyn which translates to that paper is white. All I'm referring to is the colour of the paper, it's a white sheet of paper. However, Gwyn etymologically has a rather interesting history. As well as being the word for the colour white, it can also mean blessed or holy. So Gwyn can refer to something that's quite sacred and it evokes that feeling for me as a Welsh speaker. The word Gwyn refers to something that is quite sacred, that is quite holy, that is quite sanctimonious. And so that's the first part of his name, Gwyn, which can mean white but can also mean holy, sacred or blessed. The app portion of his name comes from the fact that uh, Welsh names usually are uh, patriarchal in nature. <laughs> is that the right word? I, I'm not sure if that's the right word. But what I mean by that is that uh, people were named after their father. People were named after the father that they were born to. So Ap literally just means the son of. It's it's a mutated and changed form of the Welsh word Mab, which just means son. So Ap, if you ever see a name of a person and the middle name is Ap, it's not actually a middle name. And that's why you'll rarely see it with a capital A. Sometimes you'll just see it with a normal A. Um, that's because it just means son of. It's the son of. So Gwyn, Blessed, holy or white, son of Nirth. So Nirth is the name of his father. So Nirth is Gwyn's father. He's the son of Nirth. Now what does Nirth mean? Nirth is translated to often mean mist. It's a word that refers to mist. So very romantically we can translate Gwynap Nirth's name to white son of mist or blessed son of mist. He's very much associated with mist because Nirth, his father, is also associated with mist. Now I'm not going to get too deeply into who Nirth is right now but Nirth is another entity from Welsh mythology. He also has associations with an ancient god known as Nodens. So that's a little rabbit hole for you if you'd like to look into that. Look up Nirth and Nodens. But for the purpose of this video we're just going to be looking at Gwyn very briefly. So Gwyn ap Nirth translates to mean the blessed son of mist or the white son of mist. Now that we've gotten over the naming of Gwyn Apnir, his name and what exactly his name entails, let's get into who he is as a character. So the earliest mention of Gwyn Apnir that we have in Welsh literature comes from a book known as the Black Book of Carmarthen. So the earliest or oldest recorded story that we have of Gwyn Apnir comes from the Black Book of Carmarthen. And that story is not really a story, it's a poem. It's a conversation conversation between two characters, specifically Gwyn Apnir, and another character called Gwyddno Garanhir. Gwyddno Garanhir. This poem is often referred to in English as the dialogue between Gwyn Apnir and Gwyddno Garanhir. So being the oldest piece of literature that we have referring to Gwyn Apnir, it's quite important and it's, it's a good poem to look up and to read for yourself. There are translations available online. This conversation is actually really, really fascinating because it essentially tells us a lot about who Gwyn Apnir 
is as an entity. He approaches the gates of a fort where Gwydnogaranhir is, and Gwydnogaranhir essentially asks Gwynabnir if he's safe, if if he'll if he's going to be attacked by Gwynabnir, or if he's safe. And then after uh, saying that they're safe, after you know building this repertoire of we are safe, we can talk to each other. I'm not going to attack you. I'm not here to kill you. I'm just here to talk. Gwynapnir then reveals himself to be Gwynapnir. He tells Ga uh, Gwydnogaran here his name. And then he starts talking quite a bit. There's this conversation. So we get this conversation between Gwydno and Gwyn. And they talk a lot about who Gwyn is and where he comes from. And it, it, it tells us a lot about Gwyn's personality. And there's a lot we can ascertain from this poem about who Gwyn is. And it's in this poem that it is established that Gwyn is a warrior. He's a knight of some variety, a warrior, a fighter. He has been present at very many battles. And what's very, very interesting about this uh, this poem is that it mentions the fact that Gwyn's horse is consistently throughout this entire conversation trying to nudge him away from this area. He's trying to draw him away from this castle towards battles that are being fought in the distance. And it's implied through this poem that Gwyn ap Nyrd is present at virtually every battle that takes place on the island of Britain. It's very Taliesin in nature. It's very much, um, you know, I am present at all these things. I am this, I am that, I am this. It, it has a very Taliesin, you know, I was this and I was that and I was this and I was that vibe, if, if that makes sense. If you are a person who's interested in Welsh mythology and poetry, you'll know what I'm getting at with that. It has a Taliesin vibe to it. So Gwyn Apneir th says that he's been present at very many of the battles that have taken place on the island of Britain, and he has seen very many great warriors fall and die. And then during this conversation, it's implied that not only is Gwyn drawn to these battles, and not only does he not die at these battles, and yet he witnesses very many deaths, it's also implied in a section that is debated whether or not it's actually part of the same poem, or whether it's a completely different poem, but that's another story for another day. It's implied that Gwynapnir is a psychopomp of some variety. He is a gatherer of souls. Not only is he there witnessing the deaths of warriors, but he's also leading the souls of the dead from this world into the next. So he's he's almost acting as a psychopomp, traversing the souls of warriors to the afterlife. And this is where that concept of Gwyn Apneith as a psychopomp really comes from within modern paganism. We see a lot of people refer to Gwyn as a psychopomp, as a leader of souls, as a gatherer of souls. And this is where that lore originates, where that stems from. So after that, where else does Gwyn Apneith come from? Gwynapnir also features in the romance tale known as Kilhuch and Olwen, or How Kilhuch Won Olwen. This story is usually in compilations of the Mabinokion. So if you buy a copy of the Mabinoki, the four branches, How Kilhuch Won Olwen is usually in the back of the book. It's part of the romances, so it's not part of the official branches of the Mabinoki, but it is yet it's still a very, very important tale and legend, and it's very, very convoluted very complicated. I won't get into the full story, but it is one that's worth researching and reading because there's a lot of very interesting and intriguing secrets within Kilhuch and Olwen, I believe. In Kilhuch and Olwen, Gwynapnir is described as having all the devils of Anuvan within him. It is said that God trapped all the devils of Anuvan within Gwyn and entrusted him with guarding the threshold between our world and Anuvan, the other world, lest the world be destroyed by the demons of Anuvan. And this is where we start seeing that concept of Gwyn as king of the other world coming in. And also later, we'll see him turned into the king of fairy. So this is where we start seeing that aspect of him being brought to light. He is this leader of Anuvan. He stands between the threshold between our world and the other, and he supposedly has the spirits of all the entities that come from Anuvan, which in Kiluch Nolwen are referred to as devils trapped within him. He's the leader or the, the, the gatekeeper between our world and that world. So this is where the concept of him being a king of Anuvan 
really comes from. There are also other interesting elements to Gwynapnir found in Kiluch Nolwen. So, for example, they are told in Kiluch Nolwen, uh, a main kind of theme in Kiluch Nolwen is that Kiluch, the main hero, has to go and hunt a wild boar known as the Turch Trwy. And in order to hunt down the Turch Truith, he has to accomplish various impossible tasks. And one of those tasks is that he must find Gwynap Nirth, Gwyn, the son of Nirth, because he uh, is is vital to the mission, essentially. And Gwynap Nirth not only is essential to the mission of catching the Turch Truith, and the Turch Truith is said to never be able to be captured without the help of Gwynap Nirth, but Gwynap Nirth also needs to be riding a horse called D, the steed of Moro Oirvedog. I had to write that down because I could not memorise it. Moro Oirvedog. So, the steed of Moro Oirvedog, D, has to be uh, ridden by Gwynapneid in order for Gwynapneid to aid in the hunt of the Turch Truith. And what is really interesting about D, the steed of Moro Oirvedog, see, even us Welsh people stumble over these names sometimes. Um, what's interesting is that this horse is said to be able to gallop over the waves of the sea. It's, it's a watery association, and that's something that I need you to keep hold of in your mind. There's a watery association there. Then later in the story of Kiluch and Olwen, we are told that Gwynap Nirth is locked in an annual battle with another warrior called Gwythir, and Gwythir is essentially the arch nemesis of Gwynap Nirth. Um, Gwythir is going to marry and um, copulate with a wonderfully beautiful maiden known as Crevalat, and before he can do that, Gwynap Nirth abducts her and takes her away, and then this this eventually leads to a great big battle where Arthur, King Arthur himself, intervenes and says to sort this mess out, you two are going to battle on May Day every year from now until the end of time, until Judgment Day, until the world comes to an end, and whoever wins the battle at the end of the world, when, when the world is coming to an end, whoever wins the battle then gets the hand of Crithalad. But until then, you two are locked in this cosmic annual battle that takes place every single year. So this is a, a huge aspect of Gwynapnir's law that he is locked in this annual cosmic battle with this other entity called Gwythyr. And the reason I refer to it as cosmic is because in later Welsh tradition, Gwynapnir and Gwythyr became associated with the constellation of Gemini, which of course we all know nowadays within our modern Western understanding of Gemini as the twins. But to uh, to Welsh people in the past, the twins, the constellation of the twins, were seen as Gwynapnir and Gwythyr locked in battle. And of course, Gemini appears in the month of May. So the battle between Gwynapnir and Gwythyr took place on May Day, on the 1st of May, and so it makes sense that people would associate the constellation of Gemini, which looks somewhat like two people fighting, as Gwyn and Gwythyr, locked in their annual battle together. So that's a little bit of insight into who Gwynapnir is in Welsh mythology. He is this king of Anuvan, more or less, because he's said to have the spirits of all the devils of Anuvan locked within his body, and he guards the threshold between our world and the other, lest the other world wreak havoc on our world. He is said to ride a horse called D, which rides across the water. He is locked in an annual battle with another man every year on May Day. And he also is referred to subtly as a psychopomp, as a gatherer of souls in the early poetry from the Black Book of Carmarthen. So this is Gwyn in the mythology. This is a little bite-sized introduction to who he is in the mythology. I very much recommend going and reading these myths and poems for yourself. <laughs> but hopefully that gives you a little introduction to who he is. In later folklore, and also in poetry, Gwyn ap Nyrth gripped the people of Wales as he was transformed into the king of fairy. He was king of the realm of fairy, as Anuvan became the realm of fairy in the folkloric tradition. And he was utilised in a very aesthetic and beautiful manner by a lot of poets. Uh, and later on, he was even used in a comedic way by poets as well. So we start seeing mention of Gwynapnir being the king of fairy. And in fact, the Welsh word for 
fairies is Tulwith Teg, especially in the north. We call fairies Tulwith Teg, which means the fair family. And the oldest mention of the word Tulwith Teg comes from a poem by an unknown, um, by an unknown poet, which was copying the style of a poet known as David Ap Gwilym. And the poem in question that mentions Tulwith Teg was copying another poem. So the poem that mentions the Tulwith Teg for the first time comes from a poem called uh, A Newell Hidolis, or The Magical Mist. And it is a copy almost of a poem by David Ap Gwilym, who is a very famous and notable Welsh poet from antiquity. And David Ap Gwilym's poem is called A Newell. And though A Newell, the older version, the David Ap Gwilym poem, does not mention Tulwith Teg, it does mention the word Tulwith. But specifically, he's referring to fairies as not Tulwith Teg, but Tulwith Gwyn. And what's interesting about that is that Tulwith Teg can be translated to mean fair family or fair folk. But Tulwith in and of itself means family. It can also mean host or warband. So Tulwith Teg can translate to the fair host, the fair family, the fair folk. But it can also be translated to mean the fair host, the fair warband. So Tulwith Gwyn, the older version, literally could be translated to mean the host of Gwyn, the warband of Gwyn, or Gwyn's family, the family of Gwyn Ap Nyn. And this is how David Ap Gwilym refers to the fairies. They are Tulwith Gwyn. They are the host of Gwyn, the family of Gwyn, or the warband of Gwyn, depending on how you translate that term Tulwith. So that's some of the oldest mention of the word for fairies in Welsh, and it's associated with Gwyn ap Nyrd. So we see here the start of the tradition, or or at least the continuation of a tradition that was already set in place by the time of David ap Gwilym, of Gwyn ap Nyrd being the king of fairies. He rules over fairies. Of course, the most popular and most enigmatic folktale referring to Gwyn ap Nyrd as a king of fairy is a folktale known as Bichedd Cochen. Now, Bichedd Cochen translates to mean the life of Cochen, and it's essentially a biography, uh, a legendary biography of Saint Cochen, uh, a Welsh saint who is associated with Llangochen in Wales, but also with Glastonbury. And this story is said to take place at Glastonbury, where since Cochen, a very pious monk, Cochen is invited by Gwyn to attend a feast on top of Glastonbury Tor, and essentially Gwyn wants to prove to Cochen that his kingdom is more elaborate, more fanciful, more rich than the kingdom of God. And Cochen initially kind of rebukes this invitation. He's like, nope, nope, I don't want anything to do with that. Gwyn Ap Nyrd is the devil. No. Uh, but eventually, Cochen does go, and he meets Gwyn Ap Nyrd on Glastonbury Tor, and Gwyn Ap Nyrd is there in his castle with his courtiers who are dressed in blue and red, and he invites Cochen to sit and to feast with them, and Cochen looks around at the food and says, no, this is all deceitful and horrible. The food around me is not real food. They are leaves, they are mulch, they are rotting mud. They are all sorts of nasty things that have been put with a glamour on them so that I think that they're good food. And your courtiers are dressed in red and blue because the red signifies the fire of hell and the blue signifies the ice of hell. Because at this point, uh, in kind of the medieval early modern period, in Christianity, it was believed that hell was not only a realm of fire and flame, but also a realm of ice and cold. It was essentially just a very nasty and horrible place. You were either burning to death or freezing to death. And he said that the courtiers or the fairies that were in attendance with Gwyn Ap Nyrd on this day were dressed in those colours because they symbolised hell. And at that moment, Cochen pulls out holy water from his pocket and flings it over all the courtiers and everything, the castle, the food, the people and Gwyn Ap Nyrd himself vanish into thin air. And that story became very, very profound in a lot of um, folklore collections and you still see it come up quite a lot now in modern retellings of folklore. And it's 
quite essential to the understanding of Gwyn Apneath as a king of fairy in the folkloric tradition. So I very much recommend looking up that story as well, because all I'm doing here is giving you a snapshot into who Gwyn Apneath is. So that gives you a little understanding into who Gwyn Apneath is from the context of Welsh mythology and Welsh folklore. You know, there are elements found within mythology and the folklore which do relate to the modern understanding of Gwyn Apneath within modern paganism and in the neo-pagan kind of movement as this king of fairy, this god of liminality, this god of transition, a psychopomp. Uh, we do see those elements very clearly in a lot of these stories. Gwyn Apneath is associated with mist, with the other world, with fairies, with liminality, with water in general and the colour white, not just because of his name, but because the colour white, especially in clothing or in animals, such as white horses, white deers, white dogs, white boars, often in some manner symbolise the other world, the, the realm of fairy or just the other world in Welsh mythology. And so he's associated with the colour white in that retrospect as well. And that is a little snapshot into who Gwyn Ap Nydd is. In my practice as a Welsh witch, Gwyn Apneath is very important, especially because I also forge relationships with entities known as Echich and the Tulwith Teg, which a lot of people tell you not to do. Uh, but as a witch, I do go forth to build connections with these entities, and because he is the ruler of these entities, I see Gwyn Apneath as a very uh, important god in my tradition and in my beliefs, and I also work with him very closely and revere him quite humbly as well. If you'd like to know more about how to honour, revere and work with Gwyn Apneath, then head over to my Patreon because I'll be doing a part two to this video over on my Patreon, which will focus specifically on building relationship with Gwyn. This video has been an introduction to who he is, and part two will explore how to work with him, how to revere him, how to build him into your practice. So if you're interested in that, go subscribe over to my Patreon in the Kilchidolis tier now. But that's all we have time for today, I'm afraid. Thank you so much for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed it. A quick snapshot into who Gwyn Apneath was, part of my Welsh Deities 101 videos, where we touch very briefly upon the gods and goddesses of Wales. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel. Don't forget to check out the links down in the description and also check out my other videos. I have a whole horde of videos referring to the magical traditions and the mythical aspects of Wales. Thank you so much, and I will see you next time. Goodbye!